there be everyone. I'm probably going to, um, I guess, challenge you more than anyone else has here tonight. And I guess all I can ask is to listen. Plenty of opportunity to ask questions later. <coughs> So, Alright, so what I'm going to talk about tonight is probably mankind's oldest agricultural pursuit, which is hunting. And when you look at what we are, um, where we came from, the species, we were hunters before we were anything else. Before we were farmers, before we were builders, uh, before we really started to change our world of what it is today. A bit of an Irish background. My grandfather was a hunter, my father was a hunter. I hunt. My wife, my daughter, both my sons all hunt. It was been a tradition in our family. Hunting initially was a means of survival for us as a species. And success in hunting related to the health of the group. If you can hunt well, you ate well, if you ate well, you survive. And successful hunters within groups back then gained quite a bit of status because they were the people that fed everyone else, they were the ones that people actually relied on. The first paintings, the first development of art as a society normally depicted scenes of hunting, it depicted things that people did. And if you go back to the caves of southern France, uh, the Aboriginal paintings here in Australia, pretty much any continent you will find that the artwork will be scenes of hunting. And from that, over time, animals took on a very spiritual meaning. So we started to, 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 to pick the traits out of it. The serpent became a symbol of evil. Why? Because they bite people and people died. Uh, other animals, owls, became symbols of wives, uh, people, and so on. So cultures were based around animals. Um, the American Indians had a very strong culture the Plains Indians based around the bison. When the horse came in 200 years before, uh, they were basically destroyed. They turned into a horse culture. We actually knew what our place was in the environment. We actually understood it when we were just hunters. There were animals that we hunted that we relied on for food, and animals that hunted us. And that was pretty much we knew where we stood in the food chain. And our impact on the, our environment directly related to our impact or our ability to survive. We overhunted the species we starved, uh, which is why we, we migrated. We actually followed the herds of animals as they moved around. Then we started farming. What farming allowed? It allowed people to stockpile food, to stop us being a migratory species. And it allowed us to take one small step back from our environment. We started to actually not rely on the seasons quite as much. Then we started building. We started building dams to irrigate, so then we were even less reliant on rain. We put big, strong buildings to get the bears out, so we weren't quite as worried about being killed in our sleep. Progressively, we lost that connection. The earth's not remained, but it actually went off in a very different way for some people. And you know, some people thought that to go to status in the community, the more things you kill, the more status you have. Other people killed the food and continued to do so. And hunting started to really split. And it started to split more as a culture where we didn't rely on food anymore, where we actually made the choice of whether we did or we didn't hunt. And it became a mixture of things, the pastime for the rich, where people a lot of money, uh, went all over the world and killed animals, not because they had any great urge to kill them, they weren't killing them for food, they just killed them because they could. And that left the other side where people actually killed animals because if they didn't, they starved. So hunting really uh, moved very firmly away from its roots. It moved into an area that I guess was never meant to go. The imbalance between the needs of, of economies and wildlife. In the 1920s, the United States, I looked around at the wild population of animals in the United States and it worked out that the way farming and everything else was going, they were going to be basically extinct if they didn't do anything. I'm going to hold up the slide if you can a little bit. So, what they started was 
it's Pippin Roberts Act in, in the United States. So everyone aboard Harvey Gear, guns, ammunition, a small percentage of that went to the management of wildlife. The American wildlife survived because of that funding that came in from hunting. So that was where they turned to try and commercialise the person's basic desire of hunting culture and turn that into something they could make money from to ensure species were preserved. And there's some incredible numbers. The bison were almost shot to extinction, not because of hunting, as a lot of people think, but because the American government subsidised shooting buffalo as part of the war against the Indians. Destroy the buffalo, you destroy their culture, destroy the culture, you destroy the people. But so it was that simple and that brutal. When the Indians surrendered when the last of the Plains Wars ended, they stopped shooting buffalo and they started to come back. This act was the thing that enabled the money to buy land, farm, turn it back to the natural prairie, allow the buffalo to fully recover. And for all the species, white tail, elk, black bear, grizzly bear, all of those animals, you can actually go and buy a tag, a certain amount of money to actually go and shoot one. That money goes directly back to the running of the wildlife agencies in the United States. And that's how they've integrated hunting into the management of wildlife. Far more controversial, the campfire projects that are run in Africa. And these started to develop in the 60s and 70s. And what they looked at was, you probably all heard of poaching for ivory and, and rhino horn and so forth. The reason people did that, they were dirt poor and someone would come along and offer a few dollars and they would go out and kill an animal and they'd sell a, uh, an elephant's tusk for a pittance and somebody else made a fortune. What they did was they turned around and put a value on that animal for the local people. So that paid for their schools, it paid for education, it paid for infrastructure in communities. But more importantly, suddenly the people could make more money out of a live animal than they could out of a dead one. So suddenly the people started to protect their own interests. So a poacher they got no money out of, a hunter they got quite a bit of money out of. And that's how they started to use the culture of hunting, the desire for people to hunt, to try and sustain local populations and also local wildlife. Some of the first national parks in the world were formed by hunters. People who hunted regularly, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, was very much tied up with the declaring of Yellowstone. He didn't come up with the idea, but he was the one that declared Yellowstone, and he was a very, very keen hunter. Why did he go for Yellowstone to protection of the wild places? Because as a hunter, he could see the animals were dying. They weren't coming back. They had to have to being destroyed. Hunters were involved with a lot of wetland restoration. Why? Because without the wetland, there were no ducks. Without no ducks, with no ducks, you can't hunt. And it's all about harnessing that hunting instinct that is still in us as a species. Modern society, we've gone from being, I guess, the original culture to becoming a subculture. We increasingly urbanised. We're creating a greater disconnect between us and the environment. I grew up in the country. My first job Sunday morning as a kid was to go out and kill the chicken that we had for Sunday dinner. That was my first job. Nowadays, you probably go to the supermarket and buy four or five chickens and you stick them in the freezer and you keep them out whenever you want it. It's a very different thing about growing up in a country environment where I grew up and growing up in the city. And the more disconnected you get, the harder it is for you to understand why someone like me wants to go out and kill their own meat as opposed to buy it uh, in a butcher shop. Specifically to deer, I'm a deer hunter, have been for, for quite a number of years. Now, they've got many places in our society at the moment. People like to sell them as, as a resource. When I shoot a deer that's meat in the freezer that feeds my family for several months. And we eat venison morning breakfast, dinner, and tea. <laughs> People get quite amazed when we go to someone's house and my kids can see them on a lamb roast like it's coming out of fashion. Why? Right? Because they don't eat lamb very often. Other people see them as a pest, they jump fences, they destroy their crops. And other people see them as just plain bandy, a little deer with big eyes and talks on a TV screen. And people start to put in emotions on them and which then makes it that much harder to understand why someone could actually shoot an animal. So the big question, do we eat meat or not? If the answer is no, you're not going to eat meat, knock yourself out. I'm not here to judge anyone. If the answer to that is yes, 
So I, the first question for me is who carries the moral responsibility for the death of the animal? Can you sit down to a statement on plate? Who carries the moral responsibility for the death of that animal? Is it yourself or is it someone in an avatar? When my family sit down to eat the meat on the table at home, we kill that animal. We harvest the bush, we bought the meat out of the bush, we process the meat. Um, my sons, we sit down for dinner sometimes and we'll be eating meat that one of my sons has provided. But it really is taking responsibility for the death of that animal by yourself and not obfuscating that to somebody else. <laughs> Hunting is more than just killing an animal when it is done properly. Understanding the animal and how it behaves, reading its environment, and respecting the animal that you're hunting. Deer are an incredibly hard animal to hunt. You've got to get the sun off, the wind drop. You've got to be the right time of the day. Uh, whole deer are an incredibly hard animal to hunt. That's what uh, he was dead in front of that gentleman there on the ground. The tag around his back leg is part of the management process that they've got running in Victoria for whole deer. We've got the only or the largest growing population of whole deer in the world. They're endangered in their native range, they're not here in Australia. And as a hunter, someone who's a very keen hunter, I believe if you have no respect for the animal that you're hunting, you need to sell your gun, your bow, whatever you hunt with, and take up golf. Because unless you can respect the animal that you're about to take, unless you can understand where you are, what your place is, and the death of that animal, then don't kill it. It's a simple. I believe if you don't have any respect for the animal that you're killing, if you're only killing it for the animals on its head, then really you're not utilising that animal to its full extent. Now there are times that hunting again is a different place in life in Australia. If you think go out to an area of public land anywhere that you go and you have a massive problem with pigs that are destroying the environment and pushing native animals to extinction, you're in a real quandary. Do you take one pig, take the meat home, or you can shoot as many as you can because their presence impacts on the survival of, of, of an animal that's a little bit more precious than a feral pig, if you can understand what I mean with that. So there are times when even as a hunter I'll go out and I'll shoot numbers of animals and I'll leave them where they fall because I can't use the meat. I'm not doing that because I have disrespected that animal, I'm doing that because I've got more respect for the environment that it lives in. I'm putting it into the context of where it lives, and I'm saying, sorry, I'll make you in the wrong spot, you're doing too much damage, too big a numbers, something's got to be done, otherwise other animals are going to perish. And we have an incredibly bad uh, record here in Australia, bad native animals. One of the problems I got with my subculture, or my culture, is vilification. And that's a very uh, strongly drenched culture of vilification, most of what we do. To give you an example, there's a, a photojournalist in Western New South Wales who's doing a, a series of photographs of women who hunt. That's a subculture within hunting. Uh, picture one of the young women with a, a kangaroo that she shot and got onto uh, the internet, and she was attacked. People wanted to burn her alive. They wanted to uh, wipe the smile off the face with a cheese grater. Some of the animal uh, rights groups and so forth are talking about that picture being put on snark movies and all sorts of other things. And not many other subcultures, or maybe I, I don't live in them, but are attacked as vehemently and as viciously as we are. And it's down to the fact that people fundamentally don't understand what we do, why we do it, and the in and outs of how we do it. And that's what I said. I'm probably going to challenge you more tonight than any of the other speakers have done. And any of you who've been watching the media in recent times would have seen the way that hunters are being attacked at the moment, not because of what we're actually doing, but because we are on the front end of a political deal that was done somewhere else, and we're the easy part. So thank you for listening tonight, folks. I appreciate your patience.